good morning, everybody. This is our uh, August Global Online Seminar in Biodiversity Informatics. It is the 16th in the series. Uh, I'm Tom Peterson. I'm very happy to welcome you to this to this seminar. Um, and I'm very pleased at, at the two speakers that we have. Um, this is kind of a special seminar in particular because we are broadcasting to you from three different continents. Someday we'll have to go for five, but three is pretty good. Uh, today what we have is a presentation of a, a very interesting new data source. It's called EcoClimate. I'm not going to tell you anything about it because Mateus and Sara will tell you much more. Uh, our two speakers are Mateus Quibeiro, who's a professor at the Universidade de Goiás in Jataí in Brazil. And we have Sara Varela, who is a postdoc at the Universidad de Alcalá in Spain. Uh, and I'm speaking to you from Mexico, so literally it's three continents. But Mateus and Sara have both done some very interesting work combining uh, rigorous management of, of climate model data with good solid biological questions. So I'm very excited about this seminar. Uh, please remember to send your questions as they come to your mind to biodivtraining at gmail.com or to my personal email is fine, town at ku.edu. The point is get your questions to me before the end of the seminar and then I'll pass them on to our speakers. So I believe we're going to start with Mateus and then we'll go on to Sara. Mm -hmm. uh, but I thank everybody for tuning in and I especially thank Mateus and Sara for their time in, in doing this presentation. So I'm going to turn it over to Mateus. Mm -hmm. And okay. Hello, everybody. Good morning. It's almost midday in Jatai City, where I am talking from. Is a uh, here is a very comfortable morning. Hope you are all comfortable for watching your presentation. And initially. I'd like to thank the Professor Towson Peterson for inviting us to, to talk about ecoclimate in his global seminar series and to thank, of course, everybody for watching our seminar. This is really a great, a great pleasure for me and an honor to participate of this project. I, I'd like also to apologize for my elementary English. And speaking English is, is really a challenge for me at this moment. And I am sorry for this. But let's go to presentation. OK, well, um, ecoclimate arose in a particular context around five um, four or five years ago, more or less, in which we needed of climate data to model species distribution during the time. But um, the available climate layers um, at that moment were not comparable between past and future periods. Um, this specifically led us to search for climate simulations from general circulation models called DCMs. And in this course, we have noted that many people were interested in, in this kind of data, but um, GCM's outputs are not trivial to manipulate, and at least for we ecologists and biogeographers. The, the complex structure of net, net CDF files impeded us to directly apply the GCM's outputs to our analysis. And moreover, um, it DCM provide predictions um, in a specific special uh, resolution that are not directly comparable among, among multiple DCMs. The grid cells are not standard from different DCMs. 
Then we started interpolating GCM's outputs on standard grid cells and create comparable layers available in more easily usable uh, files. For example, we create files in PXP in raster formats. And EcoClimate is then a, a database with standard climate layers for multiple GCMs and, and times and periods, um, in, including past, present, and future predictions, um, which are available in friend formats for ecologists and biogeographers, and of course can be applied to many research, research interests. And it is important to say here that ecoclimate should be used for research purpose only. Not, um, it is not available for commercial use. And this is the ecoclimate team, and which, is, which consists today of seven members, seven important members with distinct characters and skills needed to realize this project. Of course, um, uh, this team is not completed in yet. Sarah will talk about some specific perspectives for which new collaborators are welcome. And I hope you can, can be one of we someday. Um, okay. So now, uh, hello. Hello. My name is, my name is Sarah. I Mateus, did you wish? No. Mateus? Sí. Me toca? Sí. No, no, go, go, go. Entonces. ¿Se ve? Sí. Vale, perfecto. Sí, se ve muy bien. Muy bien. Bueno, um, well, hello, my name is Sara and I will continue developing on the ideas that uh, Mateo start to, to say. So, we have this um, database that is Ecoclimate Database. And I, I structured this, um, this talk in like four points. The first point is why we need uh, to construct another climatic variable. The second point is how we construct them. I, we want to, you to understand the, maybe the difference between ecoclimate uh, variables and working variables, because everybody is used to work with uh, work. Then uh, we develop some very easy scripts for opening these layers in R. And we want to really to, to, to teach you how to do that because in in this uh, last year that the, the layers are available for downloading from uh, the internet, some people are uh, having problems for to, to open these layers and to work with them. And the last thing that we want to do is like opening a discussion about the future avenues, ideas. This project is uh, is. Uh, ongoing, like developing, so we would love uh, to hear, uh, I don't know, suggestions, ideas, thoughts, anything, okay? So feel free to send whatever you think or some ideas that you have or anything, okay? So first, uh, why would we need more climatic layers? And, and do we need that? The answer is yes. Um, why? I am I am hearing myself like echo. Is this okay? Or I am hearing. I am listening like twice what I am saying. Well, I continue. Um, we 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 do need more climatic variables because normally, at least like Matteo and me, for instance, we work with uh, Pleistocene extinctions. This means that we need uh, to develop ecological niche models or species distribution models in the present and then project these models in the past or develop it in different scenarios. So we really need to have the same climatic models in different time uh, 
scenarios, okay, just in the present, in the past, or even in the future. For instance, here in this uh, in this example, uh, this is a, a paper that I did, and I calibrated the model here in the present, and I projected in the past in different in different scenarios. Okay, so I use it here. I use it exactly the same climatic model for all the climatic scenarios. That is the, the, the thing that you should do. Mm -hmm. Okay. Normally, people work with work clean, <clears throat> and now I will explain a bit about this work clean, how it works, and everything. Work clean was amazing, and I think uh, all the people working in biogeography and microecology and all these things, we own these people a lot, this Hickman, Cameron, Parra, Jones, and Jarvis, because they constructed this model about the, the climate in the present, and they allow everybody to use this data. So in the last years, it was like a huge development of quantitative biogeography, macroecology, and 99% of these works, uh, they, they use working. So we really own them a lot. But when we are working with, with the past, the problem is that um, we, if we calibrate the model in the present, and working is a climatic model, then if, when we predict it in the past, you can see here that they are using working as a baseline for the current climate. This means that their predictions for the past or for the present, they are combining the outputs of the general equation models with working model. However, for the present, they only have working. This means that you are, we are doing like a trick. We are calibrating the model our ecological niche models with one kind of climatic model, and then we are projected in kind of a different climatic models. Okay. Now I will explain you a bit how this working works for you to understand the difference between working and eco climate. Okay, I think this is the most important thing for you to understand the differences and to think and to see if you can if you want to use it or not. Okay, so working is based on weather stations. So here is the data of the temperature. And for making all the maps of temperature, they interpolate. What is an interpolation? Interpolation is, a, is obtaining data when we're, we don't have. So here we have a point that is 0, and here we, got, we have a point that is 0 0.9, for instance. And we want to, to know what happens here in the middle. So. We can apply different algorithms. For instance, we can apply this nearest neighbor. Okay, so if I am close to a weather station that is 15 degrees, I should be 15 degrees. We can apply a linear regression. Then if I am in the middle of a weather station that is 10 degrees and another that is 15 degrees, then uh, I am 12.5 degrees, for instance. We can apply a polynomial that is more smooth, okay, but we here realize that we are already creating some rules, okay? We don't know if this is going to be like that or, okay, we are assuming things when we are creating these smooth algorithms. Or we can apply an, an SPLY algorithm. And this is the one that uh, working is, uh, is applying. And each of these interval is calibrated independently, okay? And for you to understand the implications of this thing, when you construct the maps, here you can uh, you have a, a map with the nearest neighbor. Here is a linear interpolation, and here is a cubic interpolation. Here we only have data of these points, and the rest of the data, the map, we are creating these colors, interpolating the values from these points to the rest of the map. So here you can see that the the, asp, the, 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 the special pattern of these maps are very very dependent on the algorithms that we are applying. Okay. What happens with working? Working is applying this, uh, this, well, this is, uh, temperature, this precipitation, weather stations, and it's applying this thin flame, smooth thin flame algorithm. Okay, that is taking uh, latitude, longitude, and elevation as a covariance. Okay, in the model. And you have this kind of uh, predictions that are very nice, but in some areas, oops, sorry, in some areas, like, like here, 
they are the, the distance is very high, very large, so they are really interpolating a, a lot, creating a lot of information. Okay. Cool. Now we have this kind of models. This, this kind of models are the general articulation models that are very different. Now you can see that working is an interpolation of other stations, and the global circulation models are uh, models of the whole system. Okay, so you have a model of the circulation of the atmosphere, model of the circulation of the oceans, and, and the outputs of these models are amazing. They have like wind direction, uh, velocity, different temperature, different uh, altitudes, everything, okay? So when, when, for you to understand, when, when you're working with working in the future, in the past, they are combining this interpolation of weather stations with this kind of models, okay? And what we wanted to do with ecoclimate was using the raw output of these models for the present, for the future, and for the past, okay? For having like an homogeneous uh, climatic data for um, uh, transferring the models across time. Okay, there are, there are all the other uh, climatic projects, for instance, this key one. And there is a very nice talk about Darren Criticos here in, in the seminars of town. And he was talking about, about also about uh, working and uh, about precision and like reality. Like you can see, like for instance, this working has a data on scale, um, the interpolation goes to one kilometer. So you have really, the information seems that it's very precise, but could have a lot of error, okay? And these kind of things, like, they are more rough, but maybe if we are working at a global scale, we don't need that super fine detail resolution. Okay, we can, we can discuss about this later, because maybe I'm being, like, uh, uh, controversial here. Okay, so again, <coughs> We are working with uh, places and extinctions, so we do need to work with different time slices and with the exact same models across time. Okay? And what happened? It happens that we do have the data. Okay? The, we have a lot of, here you have like the different models, general articulation models that they are. And all these models have simulations for the present, for the past, and for the future. Okay? For the present, they have simulation from for the uh, brain industrial, that is 18 seconds, and for the first half of the 20th century, and for the second half of the 20th century. This is a different presence, okay? Then we have a prediction for the past. We have predictions, this CCSM has predictions for the Pliocene, that is 3 million years ago, that is a warm period. Then we have predictions for the last glacial maximum, that is 21,000 years ago, and all these models have predictions for last glacial maximum. And they also have predictions for the Holocene, that is 6,000 years ago. So using the same models, you can predict what happened with the species during the last glacial maximum, during the Holocene, and in different intervals of the present. Okay? And also for the future. They're, they have these four different scenarios from more optimistic to more pessimistic uh, climate change. Okay? So we use this. We use these raw layers for construct our ecoclimate layers. So now I am going to try to summarize how we construct these climatic layers. So we have this kind of uh, outputs, and we only want uh, the surface temperature, okay, and precipitation of each month. This is the, the things that we need. So the first thing that it was complex, and Mateus was saying this at the at the beginning of the talk, is to understand the database. This climatic data is not that easy to understand. Uh, the acronyms of the variables, the structure of the database, it was difficult, okay? And also to work with the variables. Mateus already told you that this, this format, this NetCDF, is a text format, and it's, sometimes it's difficult and tricky to get the variables out of this kind of formats, okay? And the second important problem that we faced was, was the resolution of the variables. Because each of these models have a different resolution. Here you have the nine models, and here you have the resolution. So you can see that, for instance, this model is 0.9, 1.25. 
And this other model, Cosmos, is 3.25, 3.75, sorry. So really, they are different in the resolution, and also they don't match, they really don't match. So what we need to do is like a downscaling method, but not very dramatic. And what we did was like trying to match all the layers in one uh, grid, that it was 0 0.5 degrees. Okay, our interpolation technique uh, was more or less easy because, for instance, in um, working they work with uh, interpolation methods that they they assume that the weather stations are regular in the space. But here we already have a grid, so it's more easy. So we can apply like three. Okay, so what we did specifically, we calculate anomalies, so past minus baseline, present, or future minus baseline. And then we apply this on scale, okay? It, it was a clicking function. And we use this G stats in, in R. And this method was very good. It was very, um, it was able to, to match the original structure of the data, okay? I see it's geographic everything, okay? We compare this and we did a sensitivity analysis between different kind of methods for uh, interpolation. And this clicking was the best one, okay? So applying these kind of things, we construct finally our layers. This is uh, one picture of one of the layers, and this is 0.5 degrees. It's a global scale, and you can see here that I think the resolution is okay for working at a global scale or even regional scale. We can also talk about that later if you want. Uh, I don't think we need to go to one kilometer if we are working on these geographic scales. Okay. Yeah, cool. If you are interested in reading everything, all the methods and how we constructed the variables, you can go here to Biodiversity Informatics and, and download this paper. And here we explain everything. Okay, all the things. And Mateus was very, very detailed explaining everything, everything, all the steps. Okay. So now you know, I think, no, we, I, we were talking about the difference between working and an ecoclimate, you know that they are different. Our uh, ecoclimate is based on these general articulation models, and it is like that. It's the data from the models, okay? And we are not using weather stations. Working is using weather stations, so it's different kind of model. And in, in this section, I, I want you to, to understand how, how to, to work with, with R, okay? And you're going to see that it's very easy. Oops. So we have uh, our baseline, we have the future layers, we have the past layers, and all these layers are comparable. And you can compare across time and between models. And this is very nice. Okay? This, everything is very homogeneous, and you can work with all the data. Which kind of data we have in, in ecoclimate? Now we have uh, all these variables, all, all, sorry, all these models, and all these temporal scenarios. You can see for the pre-industrial, all the models have um, and an experiment, and there are models that they don't have experiments for all the scenarios. But well, you can you can choose what uh, what you need. Okay. You you go to ecoclimate.org. You go here to downloads, and here you can if you scroll down. Here you have all the things, and they are in txt files. They are text files. So once you download this, I will go here. And then come back. Once you download this, first you download, then you save in your computer, and then you open this in R. And the function is very simple, it's read table. Okay, so you use read table, the name of the file, the, the path of the file, okay, so see whatever folder you create and the name of um, the, the climatic uh, variables that you want to open, point txt. And header is true. Header is true means the first first row of this uh, matrix has the name, the names of the variables. That's all, okay? And you put here a name, and you assign this with this kind of R, okay? Like in like in all the things in R. So you read the table, and after that, you load the libraries. We are going to use SP and Raster. These two libraries are uh, meant to work with Raster files, okay? So after you read the table, the next step is 
uh, running these two lines is very, very simple. You do a read, read, read it, long with that, and then, and then you do a stack. A stack is like a list, an array of, um, of rasters. And done, okay? You can put here the name that you want. You can select the name that you want, and here you do a stack. CCSM LGM, okay, after applying this grid. And now with this map CCSM LGM, here you have your maps. You can work with R, you can do everything. I did some small examples uh, just for plotting, for you to plot, okay? So you can apply colors, is um, my palette, okay? So color run palettes for defining your palette. And here is going from dark blue to red because I am working with temperature here and I want this kind of colors. I am going to select uh, only the variables that are related with temperature. That is from the 2 to the 12, because the first one is an ID. So don't worry about the first one. Okay, so from 2 to 12. I don't like access and I don't like boxes in the raster file. This is my thing. If you like it, just put true, true. And colors is colorless, with 100 is okay. And if you run this, you're going to have this kind of thing. Yeah? So you're going to see V1, V2, V3, all the 11 climatic variables that are related with temperature, uh, these bioclimatic variables. Okay? So, so done. You, now you, you can read the things and you can plot it and you can do whatever. The next thing that I want you to show, <coughs> I want to show you, is that uh, this uh, stack works like a data frame. You, if you work with R, this is very normal. This dollar sign, you can you can use this dollar sign for selecting the variables. So I just want to plot uh, these maps V1. Okay, I just want to plot V1. So you put dollar V1, V1. Okay, if you do that, you're going to have this just the V1. Okay, another example just for finishing with this. Uh, we are going to plot the precipitation variables. So we apply colors, in this case color is P, that is precipitation. And in this case I am going to go from white to dark blue because this is water precipitation, so all blue. And I am going to plot from the 13, 13 to 20. That are the precipitation variables. If we do that, we have VO12, that is annual mean temperature, blah, blah, blah. Okay, all the variables that are related with precipitation. Okay. After you have the stack, that it was like the, this, uh, this here, after here, with the stack, with this object, you can do everything. Okay, you can apply all the special stats that you want. You can apply this one to a specific distribution model. You can do everything. Okay, so it's, it's very straightforward to, to really use uh, these variables and to load it to your computer and to work. Okay. If you are going to work with this, please uh, uh, just say that you, you access the database and you are using these variables. And also you should uh, credit uh, these other projects like uh, the couple um, uh, paleoclimate uh, modeling intercomparison projects, okay? You, you should do uh, a citation of them, and you can you can see here the data. So go to their web pages and, and see how they want you to uh, to visit them. Okay, and um, I don't know if I am going very fast. We can I okay. The future avenues that we were. Thinking is um, now that we have the, um, the climatic layers, you can really combine climate with everything. You have a lot of open asset databases, so you can combine databases of fossils like the PBDB or an Atoma or with data from the present occurrence of the species, and I don't know, calibrate the model in the present and project past or, the, or on the uh, contrary calibrated in the past and predicted in the future, you can really do whatever. You can work with macroecology, biogeography, paleobiogeography, spatial ecology, conservation biology, whatever. Okay, um, and we think that this ecoclimate was important to, to, to really have variables that can be compared across time and between models. Okay. 
that until now it was kind of difficult, at least for the past, when you work with uh, the Holocene and, and, and the last glacial maximum. We have some publications about this. Uh, we have this uh, thing in biodiversity informatics. Uh, here we explain all the things and the methods and how we constructed these variables. We have this publication uh, in PLOS One that is uh, we here what we did was uh, trying to understand the uncertainties of the variables uh, in the last level maximum. And we wanted to, to see if all the models are predicting the same climate or not. And no, they are not. And uh, temperature variables are uh, more correlated than precipitation. So more or less all, all the models are predicting the same for the temperature, but they are predicting very different things for precipitation. Okay, so our thoughts with this kind of uh, work was trying to, to to see how many how many models, climatic models, we need when we are working with species distribution models. If we use one model and we project this model across the, the time, uh, we are going to have one kind of prediction. And if we apply the same uh, other model or the same model, uh, using uh, other thematic variables, other thematic model, how similar will be the results? And apparently they are going to be quite different. Okay, so our recommendation is that you should work with uh, all the climatic models you can because until now models are not really predicting the same. Okay, and, and then finally we, we have one paper in review in Spanish to present this data and to explain this data. So future lines, and really we will be very happy if we can uh, discuss about this and, and if you have any ideas. So we, we want to continue doing special stats with the layers to understand the uncertainties of the layers. We, we have this, uh, this example that I was telling you with the last of the maximum. And here you can see that this is the standard deviation of the variables. Uh, BO1, BO2, okay, and I mean temperature, all the bioclimatic uh, variables, and this is the standard deviation between models. So you can see here that in the north, the models are predicting very different temperatures. Okay, and for instance, with BO12, that is annual precipitation, you can see that here the models are predicting very different uh, precipitation. Okay. And we were analyzing this kind of patterns of uh, uh, deviations and things, and, and we saw that temperature in the last level maximum, the, the maximum deviances in the in the like errors in the between models uh, are in the temperature areas, okay, in high latitude, and in the temperature is in the in the bulk. Okay, so maybe if we are predicting a species that this even really uh, far in the north or far in the south, we are going to need, we need to add different models, okay? Because each model we're, is going to have a very different prediction of the temperature in, I don't know, Alaska, for instance, and then you should play with all of them, to have like an optimistic and pessimistic scenario. And on the contrary, if you work in the, in the tropics, you should be very careful about precipitation because Depending on the model that you're using, you're going to have very different uh, prediction. Okay, this this for the last level maximum. And here you can see that the temperature values, even if they are not predicting the same values, they are very correlated. This means that the spatial structure of these variables are very similar. However, precipitation variables are not that correlated between the models. This means that the spatial structure of this um, precipitation precipitation layers is not that similar. With these results, we were discussing about uh, how to really use this, and we were saying, like, okay, maybe if you're doing a distribution model and you don't need uh, precipitation, just add one variable, like annual precipitation, and each of these variables that you are adding, you're really getting more and more noise. Okay, so just try to not use everything, but select uh, yeah, a few variables for, for avoiding having extra noise. But we can discuss also about this later. Okay? And if you see here, this is like, it was like the, 
main summary of um, uh, this uh, work. And these red areas are the areas that all the models are predicting a similar uh, climate. So we are more or less sure that what was the climate in the last glacial maximum. However, this white area, that is almost everything, these are the areas with different predictions. So with, with all these areas, we are not sure about how was the climate. We have different hypotheses, but still we are not sure. Okay, so this is the uncertainty of our uh, climatic layers. So when we are constructing a model above these climatic variables, with these climatic variables, we are adding an extra step in the uncertainty. Okay? We are not certain about our climate species distribution model, and we are not certain at all about the climate. Okay, so we should be very careful, and we should be very, um, I don't know, to say, to say these things in the papers, okay? However, you, if I am working here uh, with a species that is living here, I can say, that, okay, I know more of the climate, and this is my prediction, and here, okay, I can be more sure about what I am saying for this area than for this other area. Okay, going, oops. Oh, no. We were there, so th this this was this paper. And um, for the future, we want to continue doing this kind of special stats uh, with the layers. And we just did that for the last level maximum. And it would be cool if we can do that for the present, for the future, and analyze the uncertainties across time. Which areas we are more or less sure about the climate during the last level maximum, during the others, and during the present. Which areas we can be very sure about. The predictions of our species distribution models for it. We can also want to develop, uh, we, we want to develop a package to help people to use these variables because it seems that some people have some, some difficulties. Also, we are going to keep upgrading the web page and the climatic layers with the new releases and everything. And this is like, okay, let's see. Uh, we were talking about maybe trying to do an a special interpolation um, using the oxygen isotopes or something like that to, to, to play, okay? And this Michelle Lawin and David Polly have, have a paper about uh, that they use this kind of uh, method in plot one in 2011. All these are ideas, so we, we have a lot of ideas and very few time, so if any of you are interested in, in helping us in developing this, we are going to be super happy. So, these are more references in case you want to, to read about the climate and, and these experiments and these projects. And uh, we want to finish with the acknowledgement with the people that uh, uh, paid this kind of uh, studies. And we want to th thank the people that made the models and Tiago and, and Mariana Rich. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Sarah and uh, Carlos. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Sorry. Sarah, I've, I've um, cut off your microphone just for a moment so that we don't get feedback. Um, everybody listening, if you have questions, uh, please send your questions to this email address right there. Okay. And I will pass them on to our speakers. Um, while we're waiting for a couple questions to come in, I wanted to show you all a couple of things. One, which Sara already showed you is the most recent uh, publication of this of this working group, and it's it's in the journal Biodiversity Informatics, and it's available uh, openly. But this is quite a nice presentation of the EcoClimate site. Um, there's the EcoClimate site again, very easily available, uh, and in fact, I've recently uh, been processing data um, from this project just for my own research and have found it to be quite um, quite easily accessible 
uh, quite easy to process. So it's quite an exciting new resource, and I encourage everybody to take a look at it. Um, one question that I had for our speakers is uh, about availability of data from um, the, la the last interglacial. Um, I've, I mean, everybody has always used a uh, kind of public data set from CCSM, um, but do you know one is that data set uh, going to become available? And two, um, are there parallel data from other model, uh, other climate model centers? Hold on, Sarah, I'll unmute your microphone. Okay, I I want to share this because I realized that now that I I miss one very important uh, uh, slide. That this is life. Okay, um, now we have this Dropbox uh, address with more variables. We don't have the last uh, integral maximum because it's not available. Uh, we have the data, but they don't uh, allow us to make it public. Okay, uh, the CCSM. But we have data now for the Pliocene, so this three million years ago, and you can you can download it here. We plan to upload this to the web page, but now this is very heavy. So we should think how we should organize this uh, database. Uh, all of these things, so we have the 19 variables, and also the raw monthly t minimum temperature, maximum temperature, mean temperature, and precipitation. And this is very cool because then you can do whatever you want. Okay, And you have faster and PhD files. Um, but uh, take care if you want to download everything, but uh, because it was like 50 gigas. So it's, it's, it's a lot of uh, information. Uh, uh, so, yeah. Mateo, do you want to say something? No, no, no. All right. Yeah. Well, I believe that we don't have any questions coming in yet. And that is not at all a reflection on the seminar. It's a reflection on the delay that's involved. So certainly there'll be questions coming in, and I'll pass them on to you guys. Mm -hmm. um, but I'd like to thank Mateus and Sara uh, for their time in preparing this, and also for their, for their efforts in preparing such an exciting uh, resource for the 17th Global Online Seminar. We will have uh, Robin Engler talking about uh, work with MIGCLIM. So this is essentially a linked um, dispersal and niche simulation and modeling environment. I I'm very much looking forward to the seminar, and that should be the last Thursday in September. Um, I will post and circulate this video um, from this seminar as soon as it becomes available on YouTube. And I thank all of our viewers, and I thank uh, Sara and Mateo especially. So all the best to everybody, and see you next month. Thank you very much. Thanks, Professor.